Hey everyone, welcome in to a, another daily editorial here on the KE Report. In this daily editorial, I am getting an update from Graphene Manufacturing Group traded on the TSX Venture Exchange under the symbol GMG. I am chatting again with Craig Nickel, founder and CEO of GMG. Now we're going to touch on two of the company's three major divisions here. First, starting off with the Thermal XR division and then also moving into the battery, the graphene aluminum ion battery division. I thank you all for sending me in some of your questions, especially when it comes to that battery division. I will get Craig to address those. Craig, let's start off with the most recent news release came out just a couple days ago, January 30th. The company provided a commercialization update on the Thermal XR. Now, New Calgon held its official launch of what the brand is now, this cool works powered by GMG Graphene. This launch happened in the US at the AHR Expo. Let's start off with the decision to brand through New Calgon here. Take us through why this is the really strategy to enter the North American markets. Hey, Corey, great to be back on. Yeah, we're very excited. It's been years of work to get to a point where our Thermal XR uh, enables us to get into the American market. But the launch with New Calgon in Chicago last year is years of work. New Calgon is a, quite a well-known brand. It's basically the Cadillac of, of air, air conditioning chemicals. It's been around more than 70 years more than uh, 3,000, 4,000 or so uh, shipped to warehouses, you know, right across Canada, America, and the Caribbean. That's a lot of the reason why we chose to have a dual branded product, given that it is branded New Calgon Coolworks powered by GMG Graphene. The strategy is to have partners who can launch our products a whole lot more effectively into these markets. We are a manufacturer, and really what we're looking at here is a uh, an access to distribution, an access to salespeople, and an access to market to really have this product launched as fast as we can. It, American coatings for HVAC market is absolutely the biggest market there is in the world. So we, we chose the Cadillac of brands and companies, and we're very proud of our work with them and we're very excited about the launch last week. We think that this, this will be very similar to other things we'll do around the world where we'll pick partners who will be dual branded on products for their launches as well. So this is all part of the strategy of, of a dual branding outcome in various different sectors and countries, and, and you should see more of it coming. Thanks. So can you give us some insights on what the setup was at this conference, what you were trying to show to potential customers? Yeah, so... So Thermal XR, and you know, we talked about it before, but it increases the, th the, the transfer of heat. It can be counterintuitive that you put a coating and it actually increases the transfer of heat. It uses these things called phonons. Phonons were invented after we were at university. They were invented about five years ago, and they're little packets of wave of heat, and graphene transfers heat through phonons at speed of sound and the speed of light. Now, that's very hard to communicate, especially when you're trying to get people walking past a convention stand where there's another thousand others to look at. So we have a cooktop. We, we, we've been using this in a demonstration center, which you can actually go online and actually go through the, the three-dimensional uh, uh, look-through demonstration center on our, on our website. But the cooktop is basically coated with Thermal XR on one and normal aluminium on the other. And then uh, the customers can hopefully, you know, come past and see or the, the people visiting the stand and they can see that when they see the cooktop working, the thermal XR is pushing off an enormous amount of heat. And normally you can feel the heat from about a foot higher than the cooktop. It's that hot. You, it's hard to put your hand even closer to that. But the actual cooktop where the thermal XR is, is cold. And that's the amazing thing, what our thermal XR does. So it shifts heat away from the cooktop and thereby actually providing a cooler cooktop. Now, it's counterintuitive, but when you actually have it and you see it there and you see the, the difference in heat that, that's radiating out and then how cooler the cooktop actually is, you know, people can then obviously transfer that to air conditioning. 
because that's what you're trying to do in air conditioning. You're trying to shift the heat away from the condenser. And the faster you do that, the faster the compressor turns off, the faster you, you stop electricity and therefore you save money and emissions. So that's the setup we had. Apparently, it went down really quite well. Our representative was there and it, it, it was quite a highlight, I believe. Now, within that news release, it also talks about country approvals, giving us an update in Canada where this is now approved. In the U.S., you're still waiting for approval. Why is it taking a bit longer in the U.S.? Yeah, look, I think uh, U.S. has got to do its thing, and I respect what they have to go through with the EPA. They're going through a risk review, um, a hazard review. It's everything that we did in Australia Australia just had launched new nanomaterial laws, and we were the first ones to get through it. When it went through, they have to go through a large risk review. The data that we supply is out of the the REACH program, where they study graphene in great detail. Um, We have consultants. We have consultants on the consultants. I think there's five parties in total who are providing this, and it's with New Calgon, who's it needs to be legitimate bona fide importer and Bucalgon is there as part of all of that. So it's, it's quite a detailed submission. It shows that, that we, it, it's not a toxic product for water fleas, which is generally the test to show that whether it can damage the environment. And then it's not toxic for mouse and, and rats. That's the other one you do as well. So it's got the ability you know, to be seen as non-toxic, but every country has got to go through what they need to go through to get through the other side. Of course, once we have that, which we believe we will get, it'll be a competitive barrier. And then we'll be able to be on our merry way, putting our product into into more places throughout the US after it gets approved. And other companies are going to have to go through this as well. So, you know, please bear with us. We believe that we have everything there that we need to. We've been through this in a much greater in detail process, actually, would you believe, in Australia. Uh, with their new nanomaterial laws, you know, we we think we'll get there. So what about sales then, Craig? I always get emails asking for any kind of forecast for sales or even sales in Australia. Now we could talk about sales, potential sales in Canada. When could we start to see some sales and can you provide any forecast? Yeah, look, we're still not giving guidance and I think that's correct. I think, you know, we've all seen the hockey stick guidance kind of conversations with companies. Look, we're... Uh, we're definitely building momentum in Australia. It's a very different type of setup in Australia. Coatings in Australia are somewhat new. Uh, they're not seen as a, a standard, which is genuinely how they're seen in, in America. And that, that's why the coatings market in America is so big. It's, such a, it's seen as something that you do quite commonly. The market here in Australia is definitely growing. Uh, there are competitors who have you know, anti-corrosive type coatings, but they don't have energy savings like ours. Yeah, there is definitely a market for that kind of coating, but it's not as concentrated or as anywhere near as mature as in America. Uh, Canada will be sold through New Calgon, and so it's in good hands there. And in Asia, we also have the sales as well. We're expecting more sales as we go through this product introduction. I think, you know, I think one thing we've got to, all got to take note of is our plant just switched on not too long ago, our new coatings plant, and a new graphene plant also just switched on as well. So I think that'll probably give you some idea of what we were trying to do before and what our goals were, you know, trying to sell small volumes. But now I think with uh, new, uh, new plants switched on, new markets switching on, uh, that gives us a lot more scope to be able to explore different pricing mechanisms that can be a whole lot easier to get this product out there. And that's literally what we're doing now, which is it's just quite exciting. And there's new markets being switched on, uh, including discussions about bringing the product into China, um, which is also, uh, you know, the, the largest um, manufacturing market of the product of, of air conditioning. So, yeah, I think you know, whilst, you know, last year, you know, we'd always wanted more sales. We, everyone does, including me, including the sales guys. We did put a lot of work into setting everything up so we could do the production and the sales last year, and we've done that. And now, you know, we're kind of un- unleashing the shackles, if you, if you like, and that's what we're aiming to do this year. 
All right. Well, when we can talk about more revenue or some revenue, boy, oh boy, I'm sure my listeners would be happy to hear that. Let's move on to the battery division then, because the last time we talked, we got an update on uh, what was going on with the partnership with Rio Tinto. And you'd mentioned that the company's pouch pack is at the 500 milliamp hour stage. You're looking to get to 1000 milliamp hours. Where do you stand on that development? Yeah, look, Corey, it's very, very close. Um, we're working through the final kind of repeatability test, but it's very close to a thousand milliamp hours, which is the fantastic milestone that we set ourselves to get to by the end of June this year. So we're p- punching that through in the team, and I think news on that should be imminent. Uh, then once we've got that, then we'll be looking at building our pilot plant in Australia. Now that pilot plant, it's probably going to be more than five million Australian, and you know, so people would be saying, well, where are you going to get that cash from? Well, you know, I think we've we've got a number of strategic partners, so those those conversations are are you know, do, you know are being held, but there's also government conversations around building basically the first battery pilot plant in Queensland and probably the second one in the country, so it's very important industry for 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 australia queensland government and and australia have both identified wanting to have to be able to make um cells in the country and so you know there's there's a lot of different government initiatives for for funding for that as well so we're both been we've been talking through both there and that's i guess quite mature we've been talking there for some time on, on on those um on those different areas now that pouch cell plant will take about a year or so to to be to be put in, depending on a on a on a bunch of different um, uh, elements. But basically, that would be hopefully up and running by mid next year, which is a bit of a stretch target. But that's what we're we're, we're hoping for, and that'll mean that we'll have the ability to make the graphene and the battery about a thousand cells a week by mid next year. There's no other company in the world, Corey, that can can take raw material of natural gas or any type of raw material, even lithium or raw material, and then in 100 metres make a next generation battery. Uh, and, that, and that's what we aim to have by, um, by mid next year. Very, very exciting. People would walk, walk the line, see the graphene being made, and then see the battery being made from that graphene. And that's what we aim to have up and running next year. Now, once we have that going, we can do many things. We can we can put that into lower cost operations and scale it in Canada, in America. Uh, obviously, we'd, we'd probably like to have another plant, a large, large scale plant in Australia as well. Uh, our type of batteries, we're not in the EV market per se. We're in the diesel engine replacement kind of battery market. That market is massive and there's really no competitor. Our ability to have robust charging, discharging with no fire risk and, you know, lots of benefits of it being um, quite a low cost product as well, but very high performance will eventually mean we'll need to have a number of plants in various parts of the world, as I said. So it really does need to be made where you've got gas, which is actually North America. And that's why we've always we we picked this from the start. We we want to make batteries where people need them, because they're heavy. No matter how light you make batteries, they're always heavy because people want more of them if they're lighter. And that means you need to make them where you want to use them. And that's why it makes a lot of sense to build battery plants in America, apart from all the benefits of actually building batteries in America and Canada right now, of all the incentives. So that would be the next space, and that's of course why we have both Bob and Jack on, on the board, um, both, um, uh, both prestigious in, in their background and what they're able to bring and both from America as well. Okay, another question regarding testing of the current battery, that 500 milliamp hour battery. Have you done any testing here? Can you share any of that with us? We did a lot of internal testing, but our goal was to get to 1,000 milliamp hours and that's when we will do all the testing. 1,000 milliamp hours is, is kind of where people like to see it. Anything less, the machines actually tend not to be able to test it. There's a certain range that uh, battery testing equipment like like to operate at, and 500 is a bit odd. So that's why we've always said 1,000 is where we want to be. So, you know, I think that would all come about, and we've set things up. We've actually sent our batteries on a, on a trip 
to Asia and we've sent them back uh, to make sure that we can send them through uh, the usual kind of freight systems because that's important. You know, you need to be able to ship them around. Our batteries are very, very safe, but they're new battery chemistry. And so hence, we need to be able to make sure our transport companies can do it and be comfortable with it. Obviously, there have been supposedly flights that have uh, come down because of because of lithium ion batteries. So, you know, when we're, when we're sending our new battery chemistry, people want to know what they are about. So we've now done that successfully. Now it's, you know, basically getting to the next stage of, because a lot of the, why we need to send them is because a lot of the testing facilities are overseas. They're in various different parts of the world. And so once we're ready, we, we, we've tested that. And so we can, we can then operationalize that for the, the ready-made batteries in the end. No problem. So with this whole move forward into the 1,000 milliamp hours and also moving to that automatic pilot battery plant, how does this relate to the joint development agreement with Rio Tinto? Yeah, so we need that pilot plant to be able to provide the 1,000 milliamp hour cells to be able to provide the modules that we said we would provide under the Rio Tinto contract. So that pilot plan is necessary to be able to make the thousand or so cells that we need for the Rio Tinto contract. So, you know, that's um, therefore you can see, you know, it's been in line with what we were always expecting for some time. That thousand million power, once we get that, we'll then push into this pilot plant space. Okay. Craig, thank you. I think that does bring us up to speed here then. Thank you, everybody, for sending me your questions. Please keep sending them to me, and I'll keep following up with Craig on the back of more news and to address your questions when I get enough of them sent in. So, Craig, again, thank you for this update. I'll post a link to the GMG website, and we will, I'm sure, chat again soon. Thanks, Corey. Cheers, mate.